Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, Ambrosetti live webinar. And a special thank to Louise Beveridge for being here with us today, live from uh, France. Uh, we have asked uh, uh, Louise to spend one hour more or less with us uh, covering a really important topic today, how to manage a brand during a crisis. A really complex topic. <coughs> Just a few words about uh, uh, Louise, Louise has spent an, has had an executive career with a lot of involvement in Italy, especially when he was executive director of communication at Caring Group. Then she also had uh, significant experience in, in the financial sector. She also has been a teacher both at Science Po and uh, at INSEAD covering communication strategy. And today she's an entrepreneur and an independent board director. So really, let me say articulated, a really um, incredible career that uh, uh, will be able, and thanks to this career, she will be able to cover this complex topic from different perspectives. We have one hour altogether, 30 minutes, Louise Beveridge will spend with us uh, her thoughts about this topic with the support of a presentation. And then during the second part of the webinar, we will answer the question that you can send us through the chat. I also remind participants that the webinar will be in English, but with a real-time translation in Italian. You have, let me say, the button on the right. Now, it's time to start. So, Luis, thanks again for being here with us today. And the camera is yours. Thank you, John Luca. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure uh, to work with Ambrosetti, uh, either on webinars or, or, or in your conferences in Milan. Um, when you when you asked me uh, two weeks ago if I would speak on, on brand, obviously I said yes because I love to work with you. Uh, and then, as I started to work on the on the presentation that I'm giving today, I actually realized it's. Uh, it was quite a dangerous exercise that you asked me to do because this crisis is so huge, it is so fast moving, it is so complex. Um, actually, how do you actually make a, make an analysis or actually start to ask the right questions uh, in such a, a fast moving game? But having said that, uh, I think that I've been very grateful for, for the webinars that, uh, that I attend. So. Uh, what I'm going to try and do today is, uh, with a great deal of humility, is to maybe make a few observations about what I see, uh, also the questions that are being asked, and hopefully the observations that I make may be useful for you uh, and maybe will help you also in terms of formulating the questions that you have in terms of managing business and also in managing brands. So here we go. Um, when something is complicated, I've tried to make it as simple as possible. So I've made an agenda with uh, four points. So maybe we can just have the, the first slide, please. So. <clears throat> Let me just check. Do you have the slide on the screen, please, uh, with the agenda? Yes, yes, we will have you it. You do? Yes. yes. Okay. So with the, on the first point uh, on my agenda, uh, is actually taking a look at the nature of the crisis. I'm not here to talk about crisis management. You had a, you had a, a you had a crisis management uh, webinar last week, which was great. Uh, but we do have to understand the nature of the crisis if we're actually going to be able to to make an analysis about how brands have reacted, what has worked, and maybe what has not worked so well. Uh, the other thing that the uh, second point is to take a look at actually how some brands have reacted. My third point is to make just a few observations, maybe a few points of analysis about uh, what is working and what is not working so well, and then finish on perhaps some of the questions that I think that we need to ask ourselves uh, in terms of uh, the future management of brands as we start to come out of the first phase of, of this crisis, because obviously it's going to be long and it's going to have multiple forms. So let's take a first look at actually the nature of the crisis that we're in. Perhaps we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, clearly, I'm, I'm going to go through it very quickly. So this crisis is clearly like no other than we have ever seen. It's systemic, it's brutal, it's going to be long, and it's obviously very uncertain. 
uh, it, can, it concerns all of the fundam fundamentals of health, society, economy, politics, and also, to a certain extent, morality, individual morality, but also uh, our social or collective morality. Uh, the po third point is that it has a capacity, and it's something that strikes me every day, which is it has a capacity to polarize, uh, polarize points of view, uh, polarize so many things, to reveal and also to ask us to question so many things. Uh, it's a crisis where nobody is guilty, but we are all responsible. Uh, and also the other thing which strikes me is that this crisis is ha happening offline, but at the same time, our capacity to, to react, to act, is both offline, but also is online. Uh, and clearly the digital aspect is, is one of the major takeouts, not only of the way that we live, the way we're speaking to each other today, uh, but also one of the takeouts in terms of, of, of the longer term impacts. So having said more general points about the nature of the crisis, uh, what I just wanted to, to talk about is that very often when, you, when you're looking at crisis management on a brand, it concerns either the brand itself, the company, or perhaps the sector. In the, in the case of this crisis, it has nothing to do with the company. Uh, it has nothing to do with individual brands. Uh, but at the same time, even if it's external, it has an absolutely intimate and total impact uh, on the company, but also in terms of the management of the brand. So everybody has to deal with this and everybody has to deal with a very complex and fast moving uh, uh, crisis. Having said that, the crisis is universal. Everybody is concerned. Uh, everybody has the same point of departure. Everybody has the same level of understanding. And I would say empathy is also something that we all share. Uh, what it also means is that actually availability uh, is very high. And when I talk about availability, it's not just that people have more time. Uh, it's also that people have more, more, I would say, psychological space or more psychological availability and emotional availability as well. In other words, there's a much wider bandwidth uh, and openness to listen and openness to engage. Uh, and I would say also the potential for, for brands uh, to actually get it right uh, is there. Having said that, I think that actually when they maybe get it wrong, uh, the sanction is, is, is immediate and it's extremely strong. And I would say the prejudice is real. So actually getting the message across, the capacity to get a message across is large. Uh, but there is a real requirement to actually find the delicate balance of getting the right message and finding the right emotion in order to get it right. But if you do get it right, the leverage is, is, is enormous in terms of engagement. And engagement is actually a word that I just want to stop on because engagement is high. The potential for it is high. And at the same time, engagement is clearly uh, one of the most critical uh, levers for business and for brands, both in terms of survival, but also in terms of future resilience. And what engagement relies on is the fact that you understand who are your stakeholders? Do you know who it is you need to be speaking to? Your teams, your clients, your investors, your business partners, your political partners. Uh, so it, it means you have to understand your stakeholder environment you have to understand what it is that they need from you. And you also have to obviously have the capacity to reach them. And I'd just like to move on to the next slide, please, which is actually just puts engagement in the center of the screen. What I mean by engagement is that there are three major imperatives for, for business, which is, first of all, to secure their business, then to save their business, and then to restart their business. And if I take it in terms of the, the communication imperatives, step one will be both to reassure and inform. That's step one. Step two is to care and contribute. And that's where we are right now. And then point four or point three for communication will be actually to reposition the brand. But really at the center of those dynamics, be it the business dynamic or the communication dynamic, is the need to engage and the potential to engage. Right. Let's move on to the, the second point on the agenda, which is to actually maybe take a look at some of how some brands have reacted, initial reactions, 
Um, I've, um, I'm going to name some brands. I'm going to name some companies. I just want to, I just wanted to to say that I'm I'm making no criticism. I'm just actually trying to use certain brands in order to to illustrate a, a point that I'd like to make. I've actually, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, I've I've put them into three clusters, just to, to both to help my thinking and hope to to make it clearer is that I think that some brands I, I've put them into what I call early adopters or early adapters and we'll take a look at a few examples of that um, number two I'm, I'm calling the sleepwalkers or maybe the zombie brands brands maybe that just carried on and it seemed like they didn't know that anything was really happening uh, and what did that feel like and what did that look like uh, and then number three, uh, brands that uh, and companies, obviously, uh, that have really become contributors and actors. Uh, and I think they're the big winners at this point in terms of engagement and in terms of uh, not just visibility, but in terms actually of engagement and, and creation of value. So let's take a look at uh, next slide, please. So just let's take a look at some of those early adopters or those early adapters. And obviously, these were you probably have seen the. Uh, uh, some examples of brands and major global brands who actually played with the most sacred part of their of their identity, which was their logo: uh, McDonald's, Audi, uh, Volkswagen, Nike, who actually uh, started to they actually modified their their logo in order to get across the message about social distancing. Uh, I've also put up an example, actually, that was on my Instagram of. Uh, of a fashion brand that uh, that actually started to, to market uh, t-shirts with I wash my hands why not and then coca-cola uh, did a similar task obviously to McDonald's Audi and the others by actually rewriting the coca-cola brand uh, in terms of actually keeping social distance so I'm saying these are early adopters or early adapters they were clearly brands that very very quickly picked up the momentum picked up uh, the need to actually get across probably the most vital message, which was social distancing. Can we say that um, you, some might say that actually it was a question of opportunism uh, or that they were actually making a genuine contribution in terms of getting across the most important message. Frankly, from my point of view, it's fine. It's okay. It may have been opportunism in some respects, but I think that their message that they got across and the fact that they contributed to that uh, seemed okay. Okay for me anyway. Moving on to next slide, please, just in terms of um, maybe an example uh, of, and this is just, I've, I've just picked a, a couple here. I mean, there are, there are many, but uh, of brands where actually the, the capacity to adapt was, uh, or to change was actually almost close to zero. I think all of us have carried on receiving emails from, uh, from brands actually where the automatic emailing system just kept carried on sending you uh, information about the brand. And all of a sudden, it felt extremely strange to be receiving uh, the same messages. And also, it had also, for me, a, a second effect, which was not only that it was disconnected, uh, it also made me wonder actually about how well the, the companies were actually managed. The fact that actually the mailings were still carrying on uh, without any kind of adaptation to, to the context that we were all, we were all living in. Um, I'm going to take the example of uh, H&M. Next slide, please. Uh, the example of H&M actually, uh, actually managed to, to, to hit the headlines in, in several ways over the last few weeks. Uh, they hit the headlines because they, they ceased to pay the, the rental uh, on, their, on their shops in Germany. They also kept some shops, and that obviously created, there was an article in the Financial Times on, on them, and other brands also who, who said that they were no longer going to pay rent. Um, they also kept some stores open and some people found that it was an unnecessary exposure of their staff. And the example that I've just put on the screen here is their Instagram campaign, they, Instagram campaign where they carried on with their spring campaign on their, on their spring collections, but without making any reference at all uh, to, to the context. And I think that where you can see the fracture is actually with the comments that were on the Instagram feed uh, from clients with their incomprehension about why H&M were actually making. So um, that was one example actually from, from H&M. 
Um, the other, I'm just moving to the next slide, IKEA, uh, this was a campaign that we saw in France, uh, which actually uh, meant that they actually carried on marketing, but without making much reference, notably around delivery, all kinds of things like that, which also just gave the, the sense actually of a certain clumsiness of not quite uh, understanding the context within people within pe people were living. The next slide, please. This was a slide actually of a campaign which actually generated a lot of, of bad buzz, which was BMW. Uh, BMW actually launched a campaign by, by saying, be the roadblock of the outbreak, make your own contribution, flatten the curve. So a whole series of, of ideas actually about promoting the cars and BMW cars, but making allusions to flattening the curve, uh, about being the roadblock. Um, things where really, frankly, the, the humor was extremely poorly judged, uh, which actually then generated a great deal of bad, bad buzz for BMW for something which, frankly, was just uh, uh, extremely, uh, you know, poor, probably poorly judged. Um, moving on now to, to, I would say, the third category of, of reactions of brands, and this, these are the ones that actually I find the, the most interesting, which were the, the contributors. Um, and I would like to just take three examples. Again, there are many. Uh, and also you've had, uh, particularly in Italy as well, many other examples also of, of brands and obviously companies that, uh, that have become real contributors and real actors. Uh, and I've taken these three examples because they're just, uh, they're from different sectors. One is Netflix. And the example I wanted to take from Netflix was actually the creation of, uh, of Pool Party. Uh, so Netflix actually created a, you may already know about it, the Netflix pool party, where in order to, to deal with the social distancing and the social disconnection, uh, Netflix actually put together a technique where you could actually connect with a number of friends to watch the same movie. And whilst you were watching the same movie, you could actually uh, get in on a chat together. So it was like watching it together. So that was a, a way to contribute and to act. And clearly in terms of, of Netflix showing their contribution in order to actually help people stay connected, even though they were apart. Um, the other example I wanted to show you was it's a French uh, clothing brand, which launched a, a really clever campaign uh, on, on Instagram and maybe a little bit of a contrast with the example I gave you from H&M. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, they actually put together a campaign on their spring collection, but they, they did the whole casting of that campaign actually inside apartments. Next slide, please. And they actually set up a, a challenge uh, for their clients. So the challenge was to obviously to style the clothing, uh, to actually do it indoors. And for every sale, 10% of sales obviously went to, to the hospital fund. Move on again, please. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, if we're on the same slide, then it's a slide actually of the, of the shoes coming out from the balcony. All of the things which meant that it was a way of actually promoting the, um, the spring collection, but it clearly uh, they paid attention to the context. They put it into, they actually involved their clients in actually the styling. Uh, and they also uh, made sure that actually 10% of, of all of the uh, income actually went to hospitals. The final thing was also in terms of making masks uh, uh, for staff. The final example, if I'd just like to move it on to the Maif, which was actually an insurer. It's uh, an initiative that caught many of the headlines uh, in, uh, in France, where the Maif is a big insurer, is that what they said was that during uh, the last month, uh, obviously nobody is driving their cars anymore. Uh, there are no accidents. And so it means that actually money that they had actually put aside or which was actually part of, of what they would normally be paying out to their clients was not actually being paid out. Instead of keeping that money, they gave that money back to their clients. Uh, so it was a way also of, of contributing, of acknowledging, and also paying back. So I would say that um, from these three examples, of which there are many more, uh, it was really an important uh, way of demonstrating uh, how brands can also contribute, and more to the point, actually how they can act. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. And this is for uh, moving on to my my third point, which is what are maybe some of the observations that uh, that we can make, uh, and maybe about uh, about what we're seeing right now in terms of of how brands are are adapting. 
Let me just uh, find myself on my notes. So, I think one of the most important points uh, that we can take out, if we can move on to the next slide, please, is that I think that what we what we can I think these are these are probably seven points that I think are uh, are probably okay to make at this point. I think in due course there will be there will be many more, but let's start with these. I think the first point is that clearly the quality of leadership and the speed of adaption for businesses and for brands. Uh, is 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 clearly uh, one of the most important takeouts. Leadership is good. Adaptation is good. Uh, clearly, those are the brands that have managed to contribute, act, and to actually find uh, the right messaging. Uh, I think point number two uh, is that the importance of active engagement with all of the different stakeholders of a brand is also one of the critical points. Um, point number three: all does not stop but all does need to adapt. So life hasn't stopped, but clearly the need to adapt uh, is, is the new imperative. And point number four is that I think that clarity around purpose and social utility of a brand uh, is something that has become uh, a very, very important point, not just during the crisis, but actually one of the important takeouts that we need to think about for the future. Point number five is that clearly there is an enormous importance on contribution. And when I talk about contribution, it's not just about financial contribution, because that's obviously one point. But I think that contribution comes in many different forms. I think that contribution comes uh, in terms of um, helping people to connect with each other, uh, helping people to, to contribute in a wide, wider community. So contribution comes in many forms. I think contribution is clearly one of the big takeouts, and I think that contribution is one of the points that will continue post-crisis, or post, I would say, this phase of the crisis. Uh, point number six, um, it's important, not import, just important what you say, it's important what you do. So you have to act. Uh, acts talk louder than words, or in any event, if you say something, you must do it. I think for brands who have actually just talked but not done anything, uh, there's potentially a prejudice. So I think that actions and the capacity to act is really key. Uh, and point number seven, obviously there's a, there's a part of opportunism. Why not? The whole point is, is the opportunism something that is uh, that is well chosen? So it's more about what kind of opportunism and actually how do you take it? Um, if I'm moving on now, I'd like to, I'm just checking my time. Moving on now to, next slide please, my final uh, point, which is actually some of the questions uh, concerning actually uh, where do we go next and what are the questions that we maybe need to be asking ourselves about how brands need to position themselves, uh, how they can contribute and how actually they can position themselves for the new market. I think that one of the one of the things I, I caught this quote and I would like to, to share it with you. Next slide, please. Is that it was in the newspaper, I saw it last week, which was it was a CEO of, of a CAC 40 company. Uh, who was saying my responsibility, I'll read it to you. My responsibility is to save and restart the company in support uh, of my teams, but also in support of the economy. The question I am asking myself is which economy? Yesterday's economy or tomorrow's? And I think that, uh, next slide please. I think the difficulty uh, and the challenge, but also what is uh, really interesting is what is the gap and how do we mind the gap uh, between uh, yesterday's economy, tomorrow's economy, uh, navigating a crisis, but also trying to set uh, sustainable, um, sustainable objectives and also adapting both business models, but also the positioning of brands and the nature of the engagement of brands with their stakeholders uh, in the future. Um, the 
The points that I would like to, I've been thinking about this for the last few days, is that I think there are a number of um, questions or issues that I, I wanted to share, um, which are maybe uh, ideas that may underpin uh, the way that we need to think about how we manage our brands, how we reposition them, uh, and how we activate them uh, going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd just like to share with you maybe some of our possible working hypotheses about positioning and messaging uh, of brands um, in the year and in the, certainly in the, the 12 to 18 months uh, ahead of us. Uh, I think the point number one is that if, if there was any doubt about the importance uh, of stakeholders uh, for a business, I think there is none coming out of this crisis. Uh, we have clearly moved into a stakeholder economy. Uh, I think we have left behind the pure shareholder economy. Um, sh the stakeholder economy means that all stakeholders are part of the value chain of a business. Uh, and more than ever. In other words, what is the contribution of your staff and your teams? What is the contribution of your business partners? What is the contribution of your investors? And clearly, what is the, the contribution and the importance of your clients? And all businesses, so all executive teams and boards, need to have uh, a very clear idea about who are the major stakeholders of business, how, what are their expectations of the company, uh, and actually how to engage with them. So, the importance of stakeholders is going to be absolutely key in terms of the resilience of companies, but also in terms of the how brands will need to think about how they talk uh, and how they engage. Uh, point number two, which obviously feeds on, is that engagement and reputation are clearly uh, a strategic asset. I think they were already a strategic asset, but maybe for some businesses uh, engagement and reputation were maybe a nice to have uh, i think that clearly engagement and reputation are now a must have uh, they are clearly part of the value chain of any business be it b2b or b2c uh, and that is something which is absolutely essential and the issue of engagement and reputation needs to be built into the strategic planning of business uh, it's not something that happens at the end of a, a planning process. It's something which needs to be integrated much earlier in the thinking process. If we decide to do this, what will be the impact on our reputation? What will be the impact on, the, on our engagement? Uh, point number three, I think that uh, the importance to say what you do and do what you say in order in other words to have a very very strong correlation between what you say what you do in other words that your acts actually follow up on what you say is absolutely essential i think that maybe in the past uh, companies or brands have have talked but it hasn't necessarily been followed up by action i think that the level of tolerance for companies or for brands who say one thing but do another uh, will become very small. So I think the need to talk and act uh, and to be extremely coherent will be a very important part of, of, uh, of the next stage. Um, I think also, and this is my fourth point, uh, is that clearly environment and environmental concerns were really center stage in terms of expressing responsibility. Um, environment will remain a major point, but I think that certainly in the six to 12 months ahead of us, social impact and social value creation will really move center stage. Uh, so uh, environment will remain on the environmental impact and engagement of companies will remain extremely important and part of the, the, the mix messaging mix but i also think that actually I, I think that actually social impact and social value creation will probably take center stage um my fifth question that i'm i'm asking myself is will we be moving into uh, exactly the same competitive paradigm or will we actually move into a new one and I'm taking, um, I'm taking language or vocabulary that comes from B Corp. Some of you may know it. 
will we still be competing in uh, will we still be competing in an environment where people will be saying we're the best company in the world or will we be competing in a different paradigm where companies will be saying uh, i'm going to be the best company for the world in other words uh, is the competitive paradigm going to be exactly the same or will it change or perhaps some companies will decide that the competitive paradigm they want to put themselves into is a different one. But that clearly has an impact in terms of the positioning of a brand and also in terms of messaging. Next slide, please. Um, we can see, obviously, the level of the involvement of the state uh, and the role of the state uh, has been radically, I would say, changed uh, uh, over over the past couple of months. Uh, the role of the state is key. It's critical. Uh, the level of debt, the level of investment in companies means that uh, clearly the state will remain central, central uh, in the months, uh, possibly in years to come, in terms of supporting the economy, uh, supporting uh, social cohesion. Um, and I think that we will probably see a great deal more of public and private partnership uh, being put in place. And I think that when, when we're working inside an economy where there are more public-private uh, partnerships, clearly we change the competitive field and the nature of competition. Uh, I also think that we change the objectives. I think that we change the vocabulary. And I think that we change the messaging. So I think that the involvement of the state directly or the mix between the state and private sector, the public and private sector, uh, that change will mean that we're changing the competitive field and we'll be changing objectives and messaging. So I think that is something that we need to be factoring in. Uh, my next, next point, uh, which is a point seven, is uh, what will the new decency look like? Uh, I'm using an English word, which is uh, what is decent what is, I would say, respectable. I, I, I'm, I don't know the exact translation into Italian, forgive me. But actually, what will be decent in terms of messaging, uh, in terms of positioning? Uh, what will it look like and how will it talk? And I think that's something that uh, in terms of the way that I will look at the way that brands actually reposition themselves is, is actually looking at how they interpret the new decency. Um, I think for companies that have not yet examined what their purpose is uh, beyond the pure financials and beyond the pure, I would say, profit motive, is that for companies who have not yet really thought about what is their, um, what is what value creation do they make beyond uh, financial results? What is my purpose? Uh, what is my social impact? My environmental impact? What is my, uh, what is my value add? Uh, if they haven't done that thinking so far, it is clearly the moment for all companies to think about actually what their purpose is, uh, because the companies that that will survive and will be, I would say, the new pillars, not just of the economy, but also uh, of society, are those who have a much clearer idea or clear idea about where their, their value creation is uh, beyond the pure financials. I think that a lot of brand platforms uh, and central claims will need to be reviewed, uh, probably changed or certainly modified uh, because are they still relevant or maybe are they still appropriate? So I think that there will be work will need to be done in terms of actually resetting uh, the fundamentals of quite a lot of brands or at least making sure that we're checking them with the new environment and the new context. Uh, and my final point is that I think that timing is going to be very, very tough because uh, we have to be both quick, but at the same time, we need to take a little bit of time to actually be a little bit more considered in what we choose to do. So timing's tough, not too fast, but not too slow either. So um, it's clear that we have, next slide, please. We're clearly on a very long and winding road uh it's we still have many twists and turns ahead of us uh what i'd like to say is that obviously having said that we're all on the same road so we all know that it's long we all know that it's going to be complicated 
we all know that the navigation is something that we uh, we will all have to uh, we will all have to to think about and be responsible for. Uh, but I think that, um, despite that, it's uh, I think probably the most important thing for me is that despite the, the difficulties that is clearly ahead of us, competition will be fierce. It's clear that we will have both political, economic. Um, and social uh, tension, it's going to be tough. Having said that, I think what encourages me is that although that road will be long and complex, it's clearly a road that we will be traveling together uh, and in a way that I think is, is completely unique. So let me, uh, let me conclude now for uh, the final thing, just last slide. I'd like to thank you very much for Gianluca and the Ambrosetti team for your invitation today. I hope that some of the ideas, some of the analysis, some of the questions I've tried to formulate uh, today may be helpful also in terms of your understanding, but maybe also in terms of, of the questions that you will be asking uh, in the future. Gianluca, let me hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Luisa. Thanks, because uh, you have been perfect on time, half an hour, 35 uh, minutes. Now we are going to start with the second part of the webinar. We have already received a dozen of questions and I ask participants and to continue to submit questions during this second part through the chat. So we can start, Louisa, with the first question. And that it will appear to you on the screen. Okay. He has been made an explicit reference to a moral crisis as well as an economic crisis. How much can philosophy help in communicating the sense of a company, assuming that the company makes sense beyond the ability to produce profitability? Hang on one minute. Can you just, uh, is it possible to put it up onto the screen, Gianluca, the question? Uh, yes, you should see it on the screen. Don't you see it? Hang on a minute, not right now. Let me... Okay. I have it there. I've got it. Okay, I have it. Okay, perfect. Okay, super. Hang on one minute. So what about, let me say, philosophy uh, and the link with the, with the purpose uh, and the sense of a company? Uh, I think that um, there's, uh, obviously, I, I, I live and I work in France where there's been a great deal of debate because it's also now a legal obligation for all companies to think about their raison d'être or their purpose. Uh, so it's actually become uh, uh, now... a uh, a legal obligation also for companies to to think of their their purpose um, uh, and the sense of what they do beyond the pure profit motive or the pure economic uh, motive. Uh, in terms of putting together, to what extent will the question is to what extent does will philosophy uh, contribute to to establishing a a moral compass for companies? I don't know. I don't know if philosophy, actually, if the answer is there. I think that actually for me, uh, coming back to the purpose of a company, a purpose is actually fundamentally actually quite an entrepreneurial question, which is, why does my company exist? Uh, what am I producing that is of value? Uh, how do I make it sustainable over time? Uh, and I think that actually coming back to, to what is the purpose of what I do, uh, part of it will be moral. Uh, part of it will be commercial, uh, part of it will be social. Uh, but I'm not sure that we can say that it is purely a moral question. But I think there's morality, morality is part of the mix. Yeah. Uh, next question is about government. Because yeah. you mentioned several, let me say, interesting business example. Mm. And the next question is, how French government is managing its brand, let me say, during this <laughs> crisis. <laughs> and then the question is, what about the other countries? You can select one or more, but let's start, let me say, with uh, France, and then if you want to extend your, let me say, thoughts uh, to other countries. <laughs> I thought this, this was quite a dangerous topic, actually. <laughs> I said this is getting more and more dangerous. <laughs> Um, how is the French government? How is how is the the brand of the French government uh, managing its itself? Uh... Uh, 
uh, I'm tempted to say that actually I think that they're I think they're doing fine, actually. I think it's extraordinarily complicated uh, task for any company and for any government also, uh, both to manage uh, the, the incredible uh, complexity of the situation that needs to be managed. Um, I've been impressed, actually, by the speed at, the, at which the French government has reacted, notably in terms of putting in place the social and the economic safety net, uh, which is absolutely critical. Um, I think, like many countries, they have been running behind the speed at which the, the issues of health um, and the health system is able to react but I think that that's the same for many countries, not all. I'm very impressed by, by the, the management of, of the German state uh, in terms of actually their health systems, but also in terms of the social, economic and political, um, I, the way that they, the, the German government has reacted. Um, I have a great deal of admiration actually for, for you know, the way that certainly Italy has, has, has dealt with the crisis. I mean, you... Uh, you know, the, you you went through the crisis ahead of of all of us. Uh, we watched you, and we knew that what you were living through uh, was what we were going to live through. Uh, we had a little bit of the benefit of of actually seeing what you were living through, how you were managing it, how you were anticipating it. Um, I I shake my head almost every day looking at the U.S. the U.S.A. Uh, the almost complete absence, I would say, certainly of federal leadership. Uh, I'm impressed by by the leadership coming from New York, uh, from California. Um, but I, uh, clearly, the the complete um, uh, the lack of leadership, uh, political leadership, logistical leadership, moral leadership, actually from the USA is uh, is is something which is obviously maybe not surprising, but disappointing. Um, so anyway, a long answer, but it's a fantastic question. But um, yeah. <laughs> thanks for your next. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for your uh, answer, Luis. Not simple question, not simple answer. Yeah. Next question is about the environment. Uh, you mentioned uh, clearly mentioned that uh, social impact and social value creation will be uh, maybe the most important topics uh, over the next twelve to eighteen months. So the question is. What makes you state the, that the environment is no longer, will be no longer the dominant, let me say, topic? We're just beginning on the Verdure long track towards saving the planet. What do you think about that? Um, I'm, I'm not, what I, maybe I, I express myself poorly. Uh, what I meant to say is that uh, before COVID-19, uh, clearly the environment was the, the dominant theme it was the source of, of, of rebellion uh, and um, worldwide mobilization, both for government, governments, but also for companies. Environment remains a critical uh, issue for us all, and it's also an issue of survival. What I meant to say by that is that I think the impact of COVID-19 means that environment will obviously remain uh, an absolutely fundamental preoccupation. But I think that the issue of social contribution and social value contribution is likely to take center stage. I'm not saying it's either social contribution or environmental contribution. I'm saying that I think social contribution and social value uh, will become a dominant theme. Environment may slip into, into second place for a period of time. I'm not saying that it disappears. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question is about uh, think positive. Hmm. Think positive in this moment, would it be seen as a toxic message or let me say a boomerang? Or can we start to transfer to broadcast some level of positivity in an organization, both internally and externally? What do you think about that? I think that's a great idea. I think that's a great idea because I think that we need positivity. I think I would I would react to that by saying absolutely, just be very careful about how you activate it. 
uh, and actually what is the messaging that you put around it. I think that thinking positive, acting positive, um, trying to make the best of a situation uh, is exactly what everybody needs and which is motivating when you get out of bed in the morning to go to work. I think the only thing to be careful of is actually how we message it and how we activate it. That would be my, my answer. Okay. Uh, next question is about the phase two, an important phase where all the main countries are entering uh, during these weeks, uh, Italy, France, Spain, maybe US in the next coming weeks. Uh, mm. How do you imagine the tone of voice of brand communication in the so-called phase two? That's to say, when there will be a, a gradual return to production activities and we will have to live with a series of restrictions, like the use of mass distances between people, etc. I think I was thinking about that uh, this morning because some of the examples that uh, I showed um, today to try and illustrate, if you like, the different families or, or clusters uh, of reaction is that they're all related to confinement. Uh, and brands who've actually acted to, to echo or to be empathetic about what people are living and to compensate. Clearly, all of those ideas and those campaigns uh, will end or cease to be relevant in a few weeks' time. In, in France, it's for the 11th of May. Italy, I believe it's the 5th of May. Uh, yes, and so, the 3rd of May, yes. Yes, I know we, we, we all have the date, uh, you know, written on, on the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously the, the campaigns and the messaging are all related around the issues of confinement because it, it's not easy for anybody. Uh, I'm, what I'm, what means is that there will be the end of those campaigns and those ideas. I'm absolutely certain that uh, companies and brands who are thinking and acting and who are agile will already be trying to think about ideas uh, for the post-confinement world. And given that post-confinement will initially be, as we know, no restaurants, no cafes, masks, uh, still working from home. So it's a kind of hybrid world. It's not the world we had before, but it's not confinement. So I think that the messaging will certainly change. I think that we'll carry on uh, seeing good ideas, we'll have new humor. Uh, there'll be, I think that we'll carry on having ways of socializing online that have been invented over the past months. So certain things will carry on and we'll have to invent different ways of messaging uh, in, in the post-confinement phase. Thank you, uh, Louise. Next question is about uh, critical factors in communication. Do you think that this crisis has simply made it more apparent what are the critical factors for business success? For example, quality of leadership, need to adapt and social utility were already important prior to the COVID outbreak. It seems to be, says this participant, that the current situation has just made this factor more obviously important by creating a difficult new competitive arena. What's your yeah. point of view about that? Uh, I would agree. It's what I what strikes me about um, what strikes me is that it's extremely revealing. the The COVID crisis is just extraordinarily revealing. If if a company had great leadership, capacity to adapt, if they had already thought through their purpose, uh, all of those things all of a sudden made perfect sense. And it clearly gave those companies the capacity to act, react, to be extremely coherent in what they do and what they say. Uh, uh, and that was, so I agree with, uh, with your participant, which is that those were already essential points. We just actually made, if you like, tested to what extent uh, they are essential. Uh, okay, and yeah. next question is really interesting because uh, uh, I believe you can answer thanks to your, let me say, different experience as an executive communication director and now as an independent board member. Mm. 
As you put it, companies will focus on saving and restarting their business. Do you really think uh, communication and efforts to engage stakeholders will not evaporate due to bigger financial challenges at stake? <laughs> if it's yeah. also a matter of leadership between the communication director and let me say uh, the leadership team and the board Team. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, that's why the the quote that I um, the quote I gave you from the the CEO I found it um, thoughtful, which is, you know, um, am I here to restart and support yesterday's economy or tomorrow's economy? Uh, and of course, the I think that we are all there are many of us who are extremely hopeful uh, that what we have seen, what we've learned will actually make for a more inclusive, more inclusive capitalism, uh, will make for a, a greater preoccupation with, I would say, the ecosystem and not just the ego system, uh, that we will have a much greater sense both of our individual uh, responsibility in terms of our collective responsibility. Um, I think that we are, we are many millions to, to hope that uh, the economy that we're heading into uh, and that we are obviously we will contribute to is one which may have a, a broader morality and will have a preoccupation with creating a broader value than purely economic value. Where I remain optimistic and where I think that uh, the crisis we're living through will be a catalyzer is that the demonstration that profit alone uh, shareholder pre shareholder pre is not enough. Excuse me, I've got incoming call. Um, is that uh, the preoccupation with uh, with what's happened is that we've understood that all stakeholders are essential on the value chain. If you don't engage correctly with your teams, you're going to damage your value. If you don't engage correctly and you're not a correct with your business partners, it will damage your value chain. If you are not paying attention to your supply chain, the, ch the quality of your supply chain, you will be damaging your potential, your potential value. But also the other, the other point also is that the risk to reputation is, is enormous. What really strikes me is that companies who have got it right have gained engagement and people will have a long memory about companies and brands whose engagement was really positive uh, as opposed to companies maybe who didn't react, who got the reaction wrong. So I think that the, the impact of reputation, the impact of engagement, the understanding that no company can survive or actually be resilient without taking care of all of its stakeholders and the creation of broader value uh, is something which must remain in the minds both of executive teams and of boards. And I think the boards have a particular role uh, in, in having a wider view uh, in terms of the different stakeholders and sources of value and a longer view on what the strategic planning needs to be for a business in the future. So I think that it's a really critical point, not just for executive teams, but for the, for the boards of, of companies as well. I'm really curious about the next question uh, before showing you just a brief introduction. Um, we are delivering those webinars and uh, uh, in a unique program where 90% or even more of participants comes, uh, are entrepreneurs, CEO, top and senior manager. But we have also 5 to 10% of participants that are very young guys and uh, girls uh, that are part, let me say, of our development program called Leader of the Future. And the next question comes from one of those young guys. Uh, thank you for this awesome speech. I'm a 19-year-old guy from Italy, and I started working on a new clothing brand on January, and there was not coronavirus yet. I'm hoping to launch the brand on September, but in this period, I always have my doubts regarding the possibility for a new clothing brand in this situation. What do you think about this? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, Having said that, I think, first of all, well, you'll be thinking, obviously, you'll be thinking about which media channels you'll be using uh, to promote the brand. You'll also be thinking about 
perhaps influencers that you'll want to be using. So perhaps think about who you want to use. I think that new personalities, new influencers, uh, new messaging uh, has, has been born over the last six to eight weeks. It's been an incredibly creative period, uh, <clears throat> both in, I think it's, uh, uh, I think the, the creativity has been absolutely fantastic. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, we're going to launch your brand fine. But what I would say is that you were thinking of launching it before COVID. I think you need to rethink perhaps your positioning and possibly rethink your, your communication planning uh, and messaging. Uh, in the light of uh, in the light of of what COVID has brought up and some of the creative ideas that COVID has actually generated, because it's clear that we have a we have a you know a different creative environment. Uh, so make sure that you you leverage off the creative environment uh, and ideas that have been born over the last uh, last two months. Um, thank you. Next question. I will slightly modified i mean i will ask you to to answer a, a slightly different one um do you think that when the crisis will end there will be a permanent effect linked by the use of smart working should we expect a reduced number of people in the factories rather than talking about the factories because let me see your communication director based on your experience uh i can ask you do you expect a, a different way of a um, people in communication department working after this crisis uh, my answer to that is uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, actually, I was on a, a webinar this morning with uh, INSEAD, uh, which was talking about the impact uh, in terms of remote working. Uh, and the uh, my take out from, from that webinar this morning, but also from my experience uh, as everybody else, is that it's been a huge uh, accelerator of remote working. I think that our, our default position has, has moved and will move. Uh, do you need to come into the office to work? No. Uh, can we meet online? Yes. Do we have to be totally synchronized or can we, we work in an asynchronized way uh, in order to respect people's different rhythms or different constraints? The answer is yes. I think that uh, there, is, there will be new management skills that will be necessary uh, for working online uh, in order to be effective. How do you manage virtual teams? How effective can you be uh, on a screen? Uh, the exercise is one for me this afternoon with you. <laughs> yeah. uh, then how concise, uh, you need to be very unambiguous uh, how good are you at making uh, good notes after the meeting? So I think there will be new management techniques. I think there will be new skills. Uh, I think that remote working will become uh, a, much, uh, a much more significant part of the way that we do work. Uh, and I think also I do fall to us before we would say, I have to take a plane to do the meeting or I have to take a plane to go to the conference. And then the default was that if we couldn't go, then we would we would try and log on. I think that maybe our default may be just the reverse, both in terms of cost, but also in terms of environmental impact, which is to say, OK, let's let's do a remote meeting. And my default will be if that is really impossible, then I'll take the plane. So I think that, you know, our, our defaults will move. I think we've realized that uh, a lot of things are possible online. And I think that it's going to lead to different management and skill sets. Uh, thank you, Louise. Next question comes from uh, uh, our partner, Ambrosetti partner. It is leading the global fashion unit. Mm. Um, many experts in. I've lost you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I lost the question. Ah, okay. Yeah. Now you okay. will see on the screen. I got it, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, are saying that the major crisis that will follow the epidemic will have two major effects on brands. First, uh, will strengthen already strong and famous brands, such as identity and reputation. Second, will destroy a lot of work done so far in startups, uh, except those with a digital business model and DTC direct to consumer approach. What do you think about it? Um, probably true. 
Um, obviously, the I mean, a point one, which is that, you know, strong brands, uh, obviously, they remain, they, they keep their level of engagement, their level of visibility, uh, level of preference. Uh, having said that, I think that the way that some brands have engaged, acted, reacted, uh, contributed, uh, will make a difference in terms of preference. So that may make a difference in terms of actually how strong they are coming out of, of the crisis. Uh, so that's point one. I think that, yes, they'll rem keep their strength. The question is there may be a difference in terms of, of, of preference. Um, yes, uh, obviously, smaller businesses uh, will be uh, more vulnerable and may go out of business. Uh, and clearly, the online and uh, e-commerce uh, will have been strengthened. So those who have direct-to-consumer and the understanding also of how to market and sell directly on Instagram, uh, on other social media, those who've already built that into their model or it's inherently part of their DNA uh, will have a competitive advantage. Uh, really interesting. The next question, quite different, let me say, but we are also here to answer different questions. Is this a challenge for you? Uh, Louise, do you think that female leadership can better adapt to the post-COVID environment? Uh, I've, I've been, as, as you know, Gianluca, I'm, I've been very involved over the last 15 years in, in, in gender-related topics in business, um, in terms of representation on boards, executive committees. Uh, also in the film industry. So it, it's a topic I'm engaged on and I, I see its importance. Um, having said that, I'm always very allergic, personally, to saying that, that female leadership or, or male leadership is, is, is uh, you know, is better or worse. Uh, I think leadership uh, needs to be strong, it needs to be decisive, and I think it needs to be deeply empathetic and connected uh, and quite holistic. So uh, my, the question is, for me, I prefer to think less about the gender and more about the quality of the personality and of the, I would say, almost the value systems of, of the leaders that we have. Uh, are female leaders or female leadership more empathetic, more inclusive, more holistic? Maybe. Not always. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question is about, <clears throat> comes back to the environment, social impact, social value creation you mentioned. We have received two, three, four different questions about uh, that. It seems to be a topic that, as let me say, rather than several questions. The respect for environment means also attention to the social aspect, which is essential for contributing to the well-being of society. What's your view on this point? Uh, let me extend this question asking you, can you spend a few more words about uh, social impact, social value creation you mentioned with some, let me say, uh, examples of arena areas uh, of those uh, topics? Yeah, I, I think that maybe it was the way that I expressed it. I don't see value, social value creation and environment. I don't, I'm not opposing social value uh, and social impact with environment. They're obviously interlinked. I'm just saying that the dominant discourse in terms of responsibility before was very focused on environment and rightly so. Uh, I think that the, the issue of social value and social contribution will become absolutely essential. Um, so I'm not opposing environment and social value. Of course, they're interlinked. I just think that social value and social contribution will become extremely dominant uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. How do I, if I understand your question, Gianluca, uh, how do I, um, uh, what do I put behind the notion of social value and social contribution? if I understand your question correctly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, clearly it's an issue of uh, employment. Uh, what do I do to actually try and maintain the level of employment for my teams? Um, what am I doing about pay? Uh, we have a great deal of press right now uh, coming in from the USA, but uh, also going through France, Italy as well, 
about uh, senior directors actually taking pay cuts. So I think that it's about social impact in terms of, of being fair in terms of remuneration. It's maintaining employment. Uh, it's obviously making sure that companies are socially contributing to supporting the, the, the wider community where they actually have their businesses. So it's, con it's obviously contributing to, to childcare. It's contributing to the older community. Uh, it's actually making a wider contribution in terms of, of, of the communities that they operate in. Uh, I think that most companies also uh, have a social cause that they engage with, uh, which makes sense in terms of actually what they do. When we were worked at Caring, uh, the foundation was obviously uh, uh, was engaged on, on uh, domestic violence. Uh, so, if you like, their engagement on the issue of domestic violence, and obviously it's one of the issues during COVID, is, is that, is that will continue. So, it's their direct role as an employer, it's actually what they do in terms of remuneration and how fair they are. It's about contributing to the, the communities in which they are active, and it's about either maintaining or clearly defining which social issue the company lines up against, both in terms of, of money in terms of action and in terms of share of voice. Uh, thank you, Louise. <clears throat> Next question is about uh, taking position. How can a brand drive an opinion and give a substantial contribution without being criticized from being opportunistic with its customers? How can we as a customer really distinguish the goal of a brand? Is it acting as a contributor or with an opportunistic behavior? I, I think we've had some fantastic examples of, of brands who have been opportunistic, but they've clearly contributed. So, you know, can we say that, that Netflix, by putting together the Netflix pool party initiative where they gathered friends around a film, in it, enabled people to actually interact and have the social interaction that they're missing, it was opportunistic, sure. Were they making a contribution? Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware that it's actually a very fine line between actually being opportunistic, finding an idea. Um, but I think that as long as you're able and you're, you're perfectly clear and you're both intellectually clear and you're morally clear about the contribution that you seek to make, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I don't think, I think you need to be extremely careful about um, making sure that your, your contribution is clearly there, that you're following through, uh, and that possibly you're, you're putting part of the additional revenues possibly into a social cause uh, on the side. So I think there's also, you can, you can put in a few um, safety nets as well. Uh, next question, Louisa. It's about small companies. Mm -hmm. How can small companies relaunch an old brand, compete with, with big brands, with big pockets, and be relevant in these days? Uh, and then with some uh, additional, uh, let me say, um, details, sports that cannot be practiced now with zero sales for two months now for everyone. So what do you suggest to for the small companies? I think that um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say something that's completely banal, but uh, clearly we're heading into 12 or 18 months of exceptionally difficult uh, uh, economic, uh, the economic environment will be extremely difficult for big companies, which have a little bit more mar you know, margin, uh, whereas for small companies, they're struggling for a share of market, but a market that is shrinking. Having said that, I think that the, um, I would say the, the, the awareness, uh, or I would say the social awareness and the awareness of communities to support small business, local business, uh, local brands uh, will be much higher uh, in order to actually, people will be aware of their their responsibility uh, also to help support their neighbors, help support smaller brands, help support people who are actually trying to build a, a useful business and provide a useful service. 
So um, I think the question of size, clearly size does have an impact in terms of the capacity to absorb um, and the capacity also to have sufficient cash flow to stay alive. Uh, do I think that actually, I think with small brands, it's more about being able to be extremely targeted in, in terms of the clients, being very clear about your messaging, being very clear about what your value add is in terms of your product, but also what is the value add in terms of the support that people will give you by buying your services. Because I think that people will be very attentive uh, to the fact that they may be buying a service or a product that they need, but in buying your product and your service, they will also be providing uh, employment. Uh, they will be providing uh, income. Uh, they will be possibly providing a benefit beyond, if you like, just the, the, the functional uh, service or product that they buy. I hope I'm clear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, next question is about uh, global versus local. Yes. Uh, pandemic is global, has many brands. You mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned uh, McDonald's, Audi, and uh, different ones, Coca-Cola. Communication strategy seems to me managed locally, which is the right balance between global and local. And I also would add, because different countries are acting in different ways and with different time frames. So it's also quite difficult for a company managing the different, let me say, shifts of different countries? Um, I was, um, to answer your question, I was listening to the, uh, the President Macron was on the, the TV last night. Uh, and my answer to the question is, is a little bit uh, inspired by also some of the things that he said, which is that I think that the, the, the pandemic, it's the same for Italy as for France, uh, is that it has exposed the fact that uh, supply chains were too long. Uh, if you like the neoliberal economy, the search for you know the least expensive production meant that actually companies have become companies and countries have become very exposed to supply chains that are too long. So I think that actually local production, local supply chains, uh, and actually uh, securing. Um, securing, I would say, the industrial process and the production process will clearly be on the top of the agenda, not just the political agenda, but also the industrial agenda as well for many companies. So I think that actually the focus on global and local uh, will change. It will clearly be part of the strategic planning for companies, but also on the political agenda as well uh, in terms of actually what they need to secure. I also think that actually the impact on the environment, the impact of cost, the impact on employment, on social cohesion, all of those things actually will mean that actually local will become something more important. Having said that, I think that the, the pandemic uh, is also clearly showing up to what extent uh, the solutions lie in our capacity to act globally and to coordinate with each other, both in terms of the research that's, for instance, the way the research is being done, uh, the way that we're trying to find vaccines, uh, the fact that actually acting collectively uh, means that we will be more efficient uh, individually. So I think that the the world post COVID will be will be a real mix with a, with a rebalancing between what needs to be managed locally and the importance of local, uh, but without losing sight of the incredible advantages and necessity uh, to think globally because our destinies are obviously linked. And so we therefore we need to speak to each other and make sure that uh, we keep the coordination alive. Okay. Well, Louise, we started 45 minutes ago with, let me say, and we immediately received a dozen of questions. Now, after 45 minutes, we still have a dozen to 15 questions. But ah. time, let me say, <laughs> time is over. So I'm going to ask you the last one. Mm. Before asking you uh, this last question, I kindly remind participants to fill the feedback form that is really important for us, first to evaluate this specific webinar, but secondly also because we continuously ask you for ideas and suggestions to improve our programs of uh, uh, webinars. So next question for you, Louise, the last one is the following. Thank you for this great presentation. My question is, what do you think may be 
the biggest mistakes brands will do trying to cope with this crisis. Um, for me, there were maybe, um, I mean, I, I illustrated it a little bit, were brands which clearly, I, I call them the zombies or the sleepwalkers, uh, brands which just carried on like nothing was happening. I think that there the, the, the prejudice uh, was clear in the sense that they, they showed no empathy. It looked completely disconnected. Uh, and it also uh, asks, it makes me ask questions about how well uh, those companies and those brands are managed. So I think the, the, one of the big the areas where, which showed up uh, the lack of the capacity to adapt, point one. And I think point two uh, are the brands who, uh, if you like, played it wrong. Uh, I gave you the example of, of BMW, where, if you like, there was a use of humor, um, somehow trying to ride the wave or, or, or a way of being opportunistic that was really poorly judged. It was in poor taste. Uh, and I think the level of prejudice uh, and, the, if you like, the impact on engagement with the brand was genuinely damaged. And people were, will remember. Well, thank you very much, Louise. Now time is over. I can, I kindly, I really apologize to all the people who submit question and we have not been able to answer them. But really, we 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 would need additional thirty to forty-five uh, minutes. Uh, and uh, it's really positive from uh, one, let me say, point of view. But at the same time, we must stay on time. Thanks again, Louise, for all the time you spent. Uh, uh, with us for sharing your, let me say, your point of view, and also for your flexibility to answer all the questions received. And obviously, I look forward to meeting you again, maybe in person after the summer. We have, a, um, we, we have been knowing each other for several years, and for sure, we will have additional opportunities in the future. Thank you again, Louise. I look forward to it, Gianluca. Thank you very much indeed.